करने की कोशिश करेंगे और उसको कैसे सुधारा जाए हाउ टू रेक्टिफाई दैट ही विल बी कवरिंग सो आई विल हैंड ओवर टू टू डॉक्टर साजू फॉर इज लेक्चर नाउ Hi, good evening. Uh, once again, welcome you all to this session on biomechanics. Uh, uh, but basically, now see biomechanics is as uh, most of you have seen in here in India that it's actually more on to sports biomechanics. There are various classifications of biomechanics: sports biomechanics, functional biomechanics, clinical biomechanics. so today's thing is more on to clinical aspect but then which can be i mean i'm trying to uh, give you some idea that okay by looking into videos and also use of some uh, equipments how we can identify problems and how we could uh, rectify them and help the athlete to improve the performance uh, so today i uh, Yeah, I'll just share the screen, Commander. Can you see my screen? Can you? Yeah, yeah, it's fine. Okay. So the topic is uh, today is identifying technical problems and prevention of sports injuries. Ah. <clears throat> so there are. uh in fact most common sports injuries are shin sprains ankle sprains hamstring strain dislocated shoulder acl tear groin pull tennis elbow and there are also if you look into in each and every joint sports persons get injured so here yeah, actually this arrow is supposed to be to the ankle so in ankle joint what are the injuries in the knee joint what are the injuries In the wrist joint, what are the injuries? Head, shoulder, elbow, back, and hip. So these things have shifted. I think after uh, putting up in the presentation mode. Okay. Any of uh, you will get an uh, you, you will get the copies of this. Uh, so I'm not going to explain this, and this was uh, too much uh, to explain here. So here you can see some of the injuries. Uh, you know uh but i would like to specify on this uh, athlete this is uh, lee chong wei who was a uh, 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 world champion for quite long time and also olympics three silver medal is i mean uh, three silver medal he has got in olympics consecutive three olympics now here in this case i would like to stress upon because uh, the important thing here is that uh, 69 days before olympics he got this ankle injury and uh, <clears throat> he went on to start his rehab from the very day because he somehow wanted to uh, participate in the rio olympics and what uh, the physiotherapist uh, here i would like to stress for this for the physiotherapists uh, they worked very hard now some of the things what they looked into was that okay when they, whenever he wanted to move medial lateral that means any sideways shifting movement means uh, always they used to do strapping anterior and posterior so that there is no forward and backward movement and only it facilitates more of uh, medial to lateral movement so all those movements which are taking place in the shut, uh, court uh, this uh, sideways movements it they used to do and when uh, he wanted to do a uh, training for forward and backward that is anterior and posterior movements then the strapping was removed and they locked for medial and lateral aspects and everything what he had to do forward and backward that was done so without a fear of uh, any problem of injury because uh, now they are focusing on one one type of movement and they are restricting the movements on the either side so there the biomechanics also supported the physiotherapist in monitoring various aspects of movement that helped the athlete to really recover at a faster rate and come back to sports this just in nutshell i just wanted to say uh, now injury mechanism basically it is uh, i've just uh, drawn a chart uh, to explain that uh, in simple words 
muscle contracts when muscle contracts force production takes place and when the muscle uh, overdoes the activities or when it goes uh, dynamically into a, a higher range stress does takes place and that results in injury now for example uh, here you can see results from an over stretching a passive muscle or a dynamic overloading and active muscle so there will be a possibility of a spasm or some kind of injury or, or that's called grade 1 and grade 2 a slightly i mean partial tear and complete rupture that is grade 3 these types of injuries may take place in case of uh, this kind of uh, in, in uh, there's a mechanism and a uh, little more uh, when you are doing some kind of uh, dynamic movements like motion there is a contact or an impact and that results in an impulse that leads to a kind of vector where you are thrown out of a vehicle or you end, end up uh, with a counter retraction you fall back or sideways or something like that and that leads to a stress and leading to an injury I'm not wasting much of time on this part i'm just showing in terms of a picturized model a uh, guy walk, uh, going in bike the wall is there he hits against the wall there's an impulse the stress may be there during the contact itself and uh, that that leads to when uh, an impact on the wall or maybe landing on ground and resulting in some kind of injury so the same thing i just showed in terms of a, a cartoon picture here so in stress when the activity is low relatively you are in a safer zone and if the stress is too high then probability of injury also is quite high similarly when you are training volume is low and intensity is low you are on a safer side of uh, injury free from injury but as and when the frequency and the high higher the intensity then probability of injury is relatively quite high <clears throat> here uh, for the young generation i just want uh, young generation of coaches i just wanted to uh, inform you like this uh, this there's no quick fix for uh, solutions in sports. Sometimes back, you must have seen uh, an advertisement in, uh, on Fevicuit. Okay, one guy is fishing, another guy comes with a Fevicuit, puts on a stick, and then he puts into the water, he gets lots of fish. But in sports, without sheer hard work, there is no possibility for attaining any achievement. You just take, for example, a Dandraj Pillay. Four Olympics, four World Cup, four Asian Games, plus eight years of his preparation earlier. So altogether, 25 years of devotion he had uh, in that particular sport. That's why he achieved all this Arjuna Award, Padma Sri, uh, and all uh, Asian Games medal and so on. And four Olympics is not a joke at all. Now, if you look into Gopichan, Okay, Gopichan from badminton side, he has put sheer hard work on the, all the athletes. He himself did, uh, was an athlete, a badminton player, and he has put uh, so much of effort onto all these athletes, and they are in a position to produce the result. So there is no shortcut. That's my feeling. That's why I put this slide. Neural automation. Whenever you do a technique, there is actually a neural automation that takes place with perfection or uh, with uh, repeated exercising. So, uh, if uh, you want to change the biomechanics of a particular subject in during that time, it is really difficult to change all of a sudden. It, if you want to change the technique, it takes longer time. I remember uh, people like Annavi, who was an athlete, uh, high jumper. He was he used to do Fosbury flop earlier, and when he won, uh, 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 that's when he went uh, not Fosbury. He used to do scissor style, and then when he went for Fosbury flop, uh, basically he took long time for adapting to this particular skill. More than six months he has taken. So there is uh, use and disuse principle also need to be understood. Okay, sometimes what happens is that if you are not doing any activity for some time. Uh, quite a long time, then probability what 
a neural automation which you have achieved it it is lost and then possibility is there for you to change technique in that case but one of the thing as, and many people have pointed out that okay uh, all the sports science facilities are only given to the national level athlete but it's the duty of the coaches and physical education teachers to uh, ensure right mechanics for the beginners when you are starting their training you have to ensure right mechanics so that they don't get injured or uh, the techniques are uh, not leading to some kind of injuries okay now uh, moving on to some assessment this is actually a pattern of muscle activation on an archer for 36 shots okay uh, so here uh, the emg has been put on upper trapezius uh, middle deltoid infraspinatus of both the sides right and left so if you look into this athlete was given uh, uh, 36 shots uh, with uh, six arrows in each end and you can see the performance uh, see if you just look into this violet color graph okay this is left middle deltoid that means the uh, the hand which is holding the bow and the green one is actually the right middle deltoid which is the pulling arm i'm not so technical about uh, the terms but then i'm just telling you the pulling arm okay when the person is pulling so any changes you can see that okay at men, uh, after the fourth shot the left middle deltoid keeps on changing okay there is a lot of uh, activation i mean the activation is different throughout the 36 shot, rest of the 32 shots similarly if you look into the right middle deltoid that is the pulling up the deltoid again varies so any uh, changes in position may be up down sideways or inward or outward all these things can lead to the changes uh, variability in uh, your performance and also it may lead to variability in performance scores i know that okay in uh, archery uh, there is wind influence and based on that sometimes the uh, archer has to adjust his uh, bow and arrow according to the wind condition and then shoot but then this is this i just wanted to show it as a trend so if any variation in this middle deltoid is there means then probably this uh, muscles are not stabilized and there could be variations in the scores from uh, for the archer now another uh, 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 accuracy sports uh, this is actually a shooter uh, with thoracic outlet syndrome so this shooter is 20 years uh, he has an experience in shooting so in our biomechanics lab, we set up this. Uh, with this uh, what we did was that uh, we set, uh, we made him to stand on a force plate, and EMG again was fixed on various uh, important muscles, and the target was left and kept over here. And uh, you know, on the, in the pistol, what we did was that we put a laser light. There was no original bullet or anything like that. So pallet or anything like that uh, only a laser light and he was to uh, target at the uh, he was to point at the target and we track the laser light how it is moving so this is actually uh, you can see this uh, on the uh, thing okay the laser uh, light movement so basically it was like this that whenever he is to shoot there is to be activation from the anterior deltoid so the the bullet goes to the opponent's target that means the score is going to the opponent he doesn't get the score because there is no uh, shot on his target it is going to the opponent so uh, this was actually because of a issue called uh, thoracic and uh, outlet syndrome where the muscles has lost i um, mean it has uh, the atrophy has taken place and uh, the nerves are finding it difficult when actually when he's actually triggering it uh, the nerves gets uh, activated wrongly and that pulls the uh, deltoid muscle and it makes and uh, it and that's uh, it moves uh, the target and 
he shoot somewhere else <clears throat> so this is uh, another case of uh, uh, it's a case of compartmental syndrome and this is with uh, a squash player and this normally happens not only for a squash player but also for other sporting events wherever any racket movements are there so the main thing here in i'm not going to explain what is compartmental syndrome uh, i think most of the people know about it but i'm just giving you the uh, outline of it so whenever he goes for taking a shot you can see his uh, ankle joint uh, is very very i mean the, it's very uh, it's dorsiflex and the knee joint is almost in a straight line so he lands normally on a, is heel so you can see the center of pressure this is actually supposed to be a full foot uh, but the heat map shows only that this is the point of contact that is this particular point of contact uh, it's uh, taking place and in that particular thing you can see the center of pressure moving from the heel onwards okay and basically uh, if you look into his uh, even if he's look uh, taking a shot from the right side that is forehand stroke the whole body weight is falling onto the heel knee straight and uh the next thing you can see okay now this is the position and this is the graph based on this how much of force is generated from this uh text scan and you can see that the center of pressure travels from the heel to the middle of the foot that means he has not even shifted to the forefoot the only the pressure goes up to the uh, mid mid foot and in the retrieving process in the retrieving process again he shifts back to the heel makes his knee to be straightened and then gets back so there is no uh, uh transfer of weight from the forefoot to the back in the push off phase that is recovery phase he just pushes off with heel so because of that what has happened uh, the tbls anterior group of muscle uh, um, is encountering heavy eccentric contraction because of the body weight and as well as because of his is landing on the heel and that leads to a uh, uh, increase in the tbls anterior sheath and leading to a compartmental syndrome so basic thing what we had to do with this athlete was that uh, we have to teach him how to do the lunges basically you need to flex his, flex your hip joint hip joint has to be flexed knee to be flexed and then land with the front foot never land straight knee and landing on heel always will have this kind of problems so what we did was that okay we laid out various uh, cones in different angles and we asked him to practice i am moving in different direction and thus we enable him to correct this particular technique now coming on to a, a, another a swimmer he is actually a butterfly swimmer uh, having shoulder pain right joint uh, shoulder joint pain okay so he did also a bit of surgery and then he came back to the sport uh, but this is before he did the surgery when he actually uh, the first coming back to the sport so what we did was that again we made use of some emg to do analysis of his uh, sequence of muscular movements so we made use of a functional trainer and uh, we asked him to do the butterfly strokes uh, technique in the gym so you know one thing that electronics uh, and water does not go together we cannot take electronics into the water so it will get spoiled so we have to do all for all this water sports basically swimmers and all probably uh, we have to do everything in uh, in the land training or in the labs okay <clears throat> so uh first thing uh, here before going into this uh come i'm just i just want to ask a question to you all <laughs> uh i know there are so many swimming coaches so please uh, answer uh, as one two or three okay the question is like this okay let's say this is the swimmer um 
when does the swimmer starts applying force in the water this is one number one position this is number two position and this is number three position so please answer one two or three commander please can you just quickly find out any answers given yeah yeah two three one two three one two one two three yeah it's all mixed okay so but two is more i think okay uh all right uh just to come into the explanation part okay now if you are applying the force here in number one position okay you are applying the force on the water like this so there is buoyancy you are applying when you apply force like this the buoyancy pushes you back so you can find that instead of swimming forward you will be swimming in the same place that is one of the uh, thing which you need to understand many people think that okay you have to apply the force as soon as the water hand and enters into the water uh second is okay sometimes uh, in um, butterfly stroke yes probably you can find that okay uh, from number 2 and 3 onwards the force ap application becomes greater so at uh, especially at point number 3 the force application becomes greater so anyway good uh, uh, it's good that okay people have answered okay so what we did here was that okay we did some isometric test uh, with this swimmer so you can when you see this emg swimmer delen delen means deltoid anterior pain okay so this position we call it as isometric testing at 180 degree and here if you look into okay in this uh, graph you can find that uh, the biceps brachii was activating for the right and anterior deltoid slightly over activated in this position actually it should not activate and uh, whereas uh, the pectoral major okay just beginning to activate and infraspinatus okay behind uh activating to a greater extent uh now in the second position that is uh, 90 degree at 90 degree so which is almost the, the point number 3 in this uh, stroke movement okay uh we looked into and we found that okay now here the anterior deltoid right anterior deltoid was activating and right pectoralis major muscle is not activating whereas the left pectoralis is activating and whereas the left anterior deltoid muscle is not activating actually this anterior deltoid deltoid is for any movement upward like this okay but uh, here you find that uh, the right anterior deltoid is activating now why this muscle is activating I mean, before that uh, i'll just go to, uh, go to the next uh, graph also so even slightly more lower when the force application becomes maximum the anterior deltoid is still activating whereas the right and uh, pectoral pectoralis major is not activating whereas the left one was activating and when it in the push off phase that is in the push off phase where is almost completed is uh, stroke movement the anterior deltoid is still activating and the pectoralis major is relatively not activating actually in this area the uh, and um, pectoralis muscle is supposed to do the activation to a certain extent now i just want you all to do have a feel feel of this exercise so what you need to do is okay hold this position where your shoulder elbow and wrist are in one plane okay now keep your left hand on your right pectoral muscle don't take it up or down like this all this three in one plane the right wrist right elbow and right shoulder now try to press down do you feel the pectoral muscle contracting if it is contracting just put y if it is not contracting put n commander uh, did you try this moment yeah, the answer should be y yes so the muscle is contracting okay so everyone is given y 
Yeah. Okay. Good. Okay. One now minute. you take a situation. Okay. Same position. Now the shoulder joint and the wrist joint is in one alignment, but elbow is slightly higher than the wrist and also the shoulder joint. Now keep your left hand on the pectoral muscle and then try to press down. Is the pectoral contracting? No. Okay. So a change in the orientation of the angle has cut off this bigger muscle. Okay. Now what has actually happened is that when you actually lifted your hand, the right shoulder, there is an internal rotation that has taken place that cuts off the pectoral muscle and it activates the anterior deltoid. Okay, anterior deltoid activation is mainly because of the twist factor in the muscle. There, that's when the twist factor is there, there's an isometric contraction and that results in the muscle to show activation during that particular time. Okay, so that's why in this graph, it shows that uh, the person has anterior deltoid muscle working rather than uh, the other groups of pectoral muscles which is supposed to work. Do you get the idea? Hello? Commander? Yeah, 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 I got the idea. Uh, can I? Uh, yes. I hope people have understood this. I was telling you that the position of your hand, the wrist position, there is a lot of difference between the muscle and the muscle activation. So, this exercise that Dr. Saju has told me, ये सिंपल सी एक हाथ की सिर्फ ऊपर रिस्ट को हमने ऊपर और नीचे किया और उससे हमारी जो डेल्टोइड मसल थी उसका आपने सबने ये एहसास किया होगा कि उसमें बदलाव आ गया तो ये बात बता रहे थे सो व्हाट इज एक्चुअली हैपनिंग इज दैट नाउ द स्विमर इंस्टेड ऑफ मेकिंग यूज़ ऑफ इस बिगर ग्रुप ऑफ मसल इन द एक्� he is making use of this anterior deltoid through an isometric mode because of uh, a, a internal rotation of the shoulder joint. Now, many repetitions. See, the swimmers, they do at least something around two to four kilometers. In one lap, they do around right alone. For example, something around, uh, I mean, a total number of strokes is something around between 23 to 32 strokes, depending upon the various pace. Okay. So when they do this many number of strokes for this many number of kilometer, I mean kilometers, three or four kilometers training, this small group of muscle is uh, overused, and that leads to the injury. So the main thing is that you need to correct the technique of the stroke. That makes your bigger group of muscle to be employed during the force application. So thus, you can reduce the injury of the athlete. Now here you can see here uh, uh, from the underwater camera, what we have used here. See the right hand is shorter than left hand. It's not shorter, but it's short because he has already flexed his elbow and there is a certain amount of internal rotation that has taken place. Same way here you can see the angle and wrist position uh, is outward and internally pulled and the same athlete uh, during freestyle also you can find that there is actually shoulder internal rotation has taken place that uh, increases the activation of uh, anterior deltoid and not, and not making use of the pectoral muscles and lat muscles in the push and pull phase. Uh, I will just, just uh, explain this a little bit because this is important. Um, यहाँ पे जो ये पूरी एक्सरसाइज हमको डॉक्टर साजू ने करवाई वो ये बताने के लिए थी कि ये जो स्विमर ये जो मूवमेंट कर रहा है ये स्विमर मान लीजिए दो से चार किलोमीटर की प्रैक्टिस करता है अपने नॉर्मल प्रैक्टिसिंग सेशन में दो किलोमीटर तीन किलोमीटर चार किलोमीटर जितनी भी प्रैक्टिस करता है तो उसमें अगर वो अपनी गलत हाथ की पोजिशन से प्रैक्टिस लगातार करता रहेगा तो वो क्या कर रहा है कि अपनी छोटी मसल का इस्तेमाल कर रहा है और जबकि उसको अपनी करेक्ट लार्जर मसल का इस्तेमाल करना चाहिए और छोटी मसल के इस्तेमाल करने से वो मसल ओवरलोड हो रही है और उसमें उससे इंजरी हो सकती है 
ये बात पूरी समझाने की कोशिश की थी डॉक्टर साजू ने और ये डायग्राम में भी दिखाया कि हाथ की जो पोजीशन है ये सेम नहीं है दाहिना हाथ जो है वो थोड़ा ज्यादा मुड़ा हुआ है और उससे भी मसल का यूज जो है वो चेंज हो जाता है ये बात डॉक्टर साजू ने बताई तो ये छोटी छोटी चीजें हैं जो एक आप आराम से अंडर वाटर वीडियो लेकर भी अपने एथलीट में करेक्ट कर सकते हैं अगर उसको पेन आ रहा है या उसको उसका परफॉर्मेंस नहीं अच्छा हो रहा है तो ये भी आप शुरू से ये टेक्निक उसको सही से समझा सकते हैं थैंक यू ओके नाउ दिस इज केस ऑफ ए वेट लिफ्टर ही हैड अ वैसेस लैटरल लैटरलिसिस टायर एंड आफ्टर रिहैबिलिटेशन ही हैज कम बैक टू ट्रेनिंग ओके सो वी again put emg on his uh, muscles and then we did the uh, um, uh, analysis so if you look into in the quadriceps actually four muscle is there but we can put uh, the emg electrodes only on to three muscles so we have put on vastus medialis vastus lateralis rectus femoris this is on the left side and the same on right side so when a load of 70 kg was given so he is in the rehab mode so we have not gone up to even uh, 75 percentage of his one arm it's less than that uh, so when he is doing with 70 kg uh, relatively he is in a position to perform quite well all the uh, grew, i mean muscles in this uh, quadriceps left leg is uh, uh, activating but relatively the right leg uh, right leg is activating more because there is there will be because an injury fear there is quite possibility that okay he may be shifting more weight on to the right side but when, as and when the load is increased to 90 kg what's happening in uh, vastus medialis and vastus lateralis is a decrease in activation whereas in the left uh, that is this is the injured muscle okay so there is a decrease in uh, muscle activation and in rectus femoris there is a compensation okay and whereas the right leg it is further activated so this is basically because he is shifting the whole weight on to right leg and that's why the activation is increased on right side now in clean and jerk okay uh, this athlete uh, we tried again with uh, 60 kg we found that okay vastus medialis uh, activation was quite okay but as and when we increase uh, in vastus lateralis you find that uh, basically the activation pattern gradually reduce in vastus lateralis so vastus lateralis is the outer outer muscle of the quadriceps okay Bo- both the sides and so whereas the rectus femoris which is more on to the medial aspect and also and on, on above that activation increase and similarly but for the non injured leg right side the activation is gradually increasing as and when the weight is increased from 60 kg to 90 kg so here you can find that okay now instead of uh, lift i mean lifting with the, both the leg equally the athlete having a fear of injury and not so confident enough he tries to shift the weight more on to right side for uh, working now this athlete uh during the clean and jerk he used to have his left leg going forward uh during the jerk that is the uh jerk phase and uh, so since left leg vastus lateralis had torn i mean uh, that were, that had a tear uh, we never wanted uh, see and plus this kind of trend was shown by the athlete we never wanted his left leg to go uh, in front for jerks so what we did was that okay we asked him to train to do the uh, right leg uh, during the split part okay right leg to move forward during the split part so in, normally his habit is left leg so uh, after identifying this uh, we wanted to change uh, from left to right so we gave him a bamboo pole and asked him to do the practice so where he is to do practice of 
right leg going forward with with bamboo clean and jerk movements he does two correctly on right but because of neural automation the third one will automatically it will come for left so it took nearly one month for him to learn the technique of uh, uh, doing the uh, uh, split with bamboo itself on to the right when we started with the load when weight plates were added he used to do one or two with uh, correctly on right and uh, and when he used to do the third time unknowingly automatically the left leg used to come so what i mean to say is that this is all because of the neural adaptation that has taken place and to break this it takes longer time so in fact this athlete took around 4 to 5 months to relearn the technique of uh, doing the uh, um, split and lunge on right side and improve upon thereafter so it takes 4 to 5 months so that's why i told in the initial stage there is no shortcut we have we have to dedicate lot of time for correction part and that may vary from athlete to athlete depending upon their uh, Uh, levels so it is better that when you teach youngsters if you start teaching them at the younger age itself the right me uh, methods then probably they will adapt much faster now i will stop you here one minute yeah. just go back to the last slide please ha to isme dr saju ne humko ek bahut achhi baat batayi ki jo hamara dimag automatic usme chala jata hai jo hamari नर्वस सिस्टम जो अपना ऑटोमेटिक क्योंकि हमने इतना ज्यादा सीखा हुआ है वो और उसको बदलने में हमको बहुत समय लगता है उस यही बता रहे थे कि ये इस वेटलिफ्टर के बाएं पैर की बाहरी ऊपर की जो बाहरी मसल होती है उसमें टेयर हो गया था तो इसकी वजह से उसका जो लोड जब वो ऊपर क्लीन एंड जग में करता था तो राइट की तरफ शिफ्ट होता था तो इन्होंने क्या किया कि जब वो स्प्लिट पहले वो लेफ्ट लेग आगे से लेकर के स्प्लिट करता था उसको चेंज किया और उसको राइट लेग आगे लेके स्प्लिट करना सिखाया तो इस पूरे प्रोसेस में डॉक्टर साजू ने बताया कि करीब चार से पांच महीने लगे क्योंकि आदत जो बन गई थी आदत ये बन गई थी कि जब स्प्लिट करना है तो बाया पैर आगे करके करना है और बाया पैर क्योंकि इंजर हुआ था तो इसलिए बाया पैर को आगे करने से ठीक से नहीं हो रहा था तो ये पहले उन्होंने उसको एक खाली बैम्बू दे करके एक सिर्फ पोल दे करके ये प्रैक्टिस कराई कि आपको हर बार राइट पैर को आगे करके ही करना है तो इसमें करीब तीन से चार पांच महीने लगे तो ये वे बता रहे हैं कि कोई शॉर्टकट नहीं है जब अगर इंजरी होती है या कुछ भी होता है तो शॉर्टकट लेने की जरूरत नहीं है समय बताइए और टेक्निक को ठीक से यूज करिए okay now this is actually a uh, uh, a badminton player with shoulder injury so this uh, badminton player i mean um, before this i would like to say okay this athlete uh, later on after one year he went on to win a uh, bronze medal in uh, commonwealth games in australia okay that's in 2018 2018 commonwealth games all right so this one uh, badminton player uh, the shoulder injury so this at, uh, athlete had a shoulder injury before five months before he, she came for doing testing and uh, bunker shoulder arthroscopy resection and debridement done and he was undergoing rehab been hours uh, that is in malaysia okay now incidentally this uh, athlete uh, after the injury happen to be a pa, uh, mixed doubles player and uh, happen to win a silver medal in rio olympics so uh, after the injury we wanted to see that okay whether uh, the the athlete uh, was okay when actually it was back the back area of the shoulder which was actually injured so when when you are doing any kind of backward movement whether uh muscles are working or not so we put uh, emg on levator scapulae trapezius lower up and upper trapezius posterior deltoid infraspinatus and serratus anterior so in this test uh, she was doing quite well then we 
uh, tried out a dummy action back swing and forward swing without shuttle okay now this is without shuttle please look into the picture very carefully okay this is without shuttle now with shuttle so what we did was that we had a shuttle launcher so the shuttle launcher is to uh, release the shuttle at a particular height at a particular speed and this athlete was supposed to uh, go for a overhead uh, go for backswing and a overhead uh, shot okay now the emg results shows that without the shuttle all the muscles see this blue graph shows okay without the shuttle all the muscles were working very fine but when it came with with shuttle the red one okay the activation becomes lower in all the muscles the activation is relatively lower now uh, when the report was submitted to the medical doctors they they say that okay uh, with without shuttle no issue but the athlete is supposed to play with shuttle and hence uh, the muscle activation is relatively less so we should not clear this subject to go and play for the tournaments so i intervened and said uh, i feel that that is not the right thing to do we have to allow this athlete to uh, play because there is no sign of pain and the athlete was in a position to execute the stroke very well now the uh, you need to be little uh, careful about the interpretation of the results okay now that's why i asked you to observe this picture okay see the first picture here uh, the head is straight and the person is body is erect and he is taking the shot, uh, hand backward and then um, make the stroke so in this erect erect portion if you want to take the hand back take a hand backward for a back swing you have to apply force on the muscle that means the muscle activation will be there now in the next picture if you see actually uh, the head is slightly backward and the body also slightly tilted okay so when you actually going to make a shot if your back swing is there you don't have to really do the back swing because of your body position itself okay backward uh, a backward slight backward bend the gravitational force has assist the muscles in uh, and of the all and also the joints or the and also the upper extremity to pull back itself so here actually the muscles does not need to activate in this particular portion and from there itself she is in a position to ex execute the stroke so sometimes it becomes a dicey situation for the medical doctors to really understand the situation and uh, give a clearance certificate for the athlete so unless someone who has a knowledge on interpretation of the data based on uh, me mechanics and uh, on, on, and also based on this kind of issue then only this kind of athletes can get cleared for participating in sport so then finally after my explanation to the medical doctor they had cleared the athlete and uh, the athlete uh, was quite uh, uh, good in continuing her performance after this so now coming on to uh, the badminton itself but i would like to talk in terms of uh, uh, a posture of women that is upper extremity structure in men and women now if you just take your hand all the males if you take your hands and uh, hand and uh, uh, keep it straight that is if you keep your arm straight your shoulder joint elbow joint and the wrist joint seems to be in uh, one line so this is the male's uh, arm so you can see here the shoulder joint elbow joint and the wrist is almost in one line but whereas for female shoulder joint is here elbow is here and there is a slight 15 to 20 degrees uh, lateral flexion of the elbow so here you see this lady uh, with hand raised you can find you can easily identify that the women have a uh, different anatomical structure in terms of upper, upper extremity and the men has a different uh, anatomical structure as compared to uh, I mean, uh, uh, a different anatomical structure 
so what i mean to say is that when women are exercising okay when women are exercising now if i ask a man to take a shot at the let's say that a volleyball spike is being done they are in a position to spike uh, in relation to the shoulder joint straight like this but when you ask the women to do that instead of having uh, the uh, elbow in this uh, in line with the shoulder you find that elbow is slightly backward and they try to adjust the wrist in line with the shoulder and they contact if you ask them to keep this position and contact exact uh, contact the arms exactly in relation to the elbow and shoulder they will contact the ball behind because of this anatomical structure so any athlete who are doing training they don't have the similar execution movement as that is any women athlete who is doing training they don't have the same structure of movement as that of the men in terms of upper extremity movements now here if you just look into this uh, badminton athlete so there's actually a shoulder internal rotation similar to that of the swimming see uh, the contact is here now the wrist is wrist and shoulder is in one line but the elbow is okay elbow is higher than the wrist and shoulder line so what happens is that there is a high internal rotation in the follow through phase so here you can see the wrist has gone relatively inward elbow and the shoulder is here so you find that uh, the high amount of internal rotation so these kind of badminton players they need to have a really a strong shoulder and uh, the set of muscles around this particular area upper extremity needs to be really strong same way uh, here you can see uh, again uh, when you are asked to contact the shuttle okay in relation to the joint they contact the shuttle away from the uh, the point of pivot that is uh, the shoulder joint pivoting so if, it's, if your joint is here but you contact away from the joint so that means uh, the yesterday i gave you an example okay carrying bucket of water in line with the shoulder is easier as compared to carrying a uh, bucket of water away from the shoulder so any application of force away from the shoulder can result in some kind of shoulder injuries so uh, uh, the trainers and coaches who are actually dealing with badminton players especially women they need to work a lot on the shoulder similarly in hockey if you are if you are working on uh, drag flickers women drag flickers the men will be in a position to have this uh, three joints in one alignment but because of this uh, uh, 15 to 25 degrees external lateral flexion of the elbow when they come for drag flicking you find that in this particular position the elbow will be slightly outward so the angle of working uh, uh, for strength for women is different in hockey as compared to that of the men okay now similarly the lower extremity structures now this is a, a girl okay in, this is a sports karate uh, when they uh, when the karate person is doing the combat you find that uh, most of the time the knee joint that is they'll be keeping on bouncing so if their toes are face inward so normally what happens is that there is medial movement of the knee so the the knee joint will be moving medially and laterally so this athlete used to have uh, pain after every training session because continuous both the joints are training i mean moving medially one is because of the q angle because they have wider hips so the q angle of the quadriceps quadris quadris angle of the uh, knee or uh, for both the uh, legs will be more inward leading to lot of uh, medial that is valgus movement and uh, and having an impact on to the knee joint and uh, this was mainly because you see the orientation of the toe it is both facing uh, parallelly that is in front of you like this so what we did was that we asked the athlete to change the orientation of this leading leg 
in this direction that means say this can be facing front but this one you need to keep it facing the opponent so what help what happens is that uh, here in this case if it is in side case now you you need to pivot on your leg and make use of your lateral group of muscles in back and that is the, during the retrieval movements okay attacking and retrieving movements so you are using a smaller group of muscles abductors to push off sideways whereas if you keep like this this is permissible movement knee extension and flexion can take place because the toe is facing this way so you can have uh, you can just flex your i mean extend your knee and push back okay so this way you can push back so that is the advantage so this athlete just a small modification in technique correction helped her in two ways one is to recover from the injury second one is enabling the athlete to recover fast after an attack and incidentally this athlete also in 2006 uh, asian games uh, she went on to win a gold medal in sports karate in asian games <coughs> now another thing is on uh, beginners and equipments most of the people most of the coaches what they uh, or most of the parents what they do is that they buy hockey sticks which is uh, not as a regular size according to the uh, beginners they buy 36 inches or 38 inches long hockey sticks and they think that okay this is a five year plan so you use the hockey stick for five year so in this what ha actually happens is that since the reach is not much the people hold the hockey stick hockey stick in middle see you can see that's much of gap is there keep the ball away from the body and then make the stroke or they adjust the ball and keep it in front of their body and then contact the ball only in front which leads to a uh, ball raising and going or sometimes to facilitate uh, the stick swing what they do is that after execution uh, they pull back the knee so it's stressing the ankle joint and knee joint so uh, giving longer hockey sticks or longer i um, mean bigger uh, tennis rackets or heavier cricket bat to all these youngsters will uh, make them to lose their ability to learn the skills in a proper manner so for different age groups probably you need to see that you provide the things exactly according to their requirement if probably 27 inches hockey stick or 30 inches hockey stick depending upon the height if they can be selected and if it's given then they would learn the technique properly and also benefit in improving their skills now this is a drag flicker uh and actually this is the direction of the goal post okay this this is the direction of the goal post now you find that once he starts to drag the ball here you can see his toe is pointing away from the goal that is towards the t point is not facing towards the goal so when the linear forces i mean linear movement is taking place and plus the dragging of the ball and uh, the rotation of the trunk that is taking place lot of uh, forces acts on to the joint and it does since it is a sideways position of the movement the knee joint does not allow any kind of extension flexion but then he compensate that on to the ankle joint and the ankle foot rolling takes place and results in some kind of ankle injury okay so what basically you need to do is something like this here you can see this video uh this is a piece a penalty on a flicker uh, george lombi from argentina okay now i'll just sh okay you see is a uh, left leg the orientation of the left leg is pointing towards the goal now what happens is that when is actually moving forward sorry when is moving forward when the drag is taking place the knee joint can flex i mean uh, flex and then go for extension in straight position 
facilitating the heel raise and the uh, drag flicker without any kind of injury he can move forward okay uh, from a side view will be you can see the same from side view okay i'll just show it in a bit of slow motion now see the orientation of the toe it is towards the goal okay so you can see the knee now is housed over the ankle joint and this uh, uh, since the pelvic has been opened in this direction you can easily transfer the body weight onto the leading leg and uh, without any problem rolling of the foot because now here is actually facilitating heel toe movement the heel is raised and that is being i mean he is overcoming the same thing in the follow through without any problem so in chance of injury is relatively less and he is in a position to execute the movement much better okay now this is a walker with anterior knee pain and also he was, she was suffering from uh, maltracking of patella so if you look into uh see um, when they walk basically they have cross leg movements always the uh, the foot goes in front of the other but across towards the medial aspect but the main issue is here uh when the athlete is in mid stance position and when she is shifting the weight forward the heel is still contacting the ground and this leads to an hyper extension of the knee joint and because of that maltracking of the patella is taking place and plus uh, knee joint pain so here the correction in technique is two things one is strengthening of the hamstring okay so that it doesn't allow this much of flexibility in the hamstring group of muscle second thing is the technical aspects when the body weight is being shifted simultaneously the athlete should focus on lifting the heels this will reduce maltracking and plus uh, pain of the knee joint so correction in this part for this athlete would do a good for uh, future workouts <clears throat> uh this is a swimmer with hyper extension of knee this is the start position so it's uh, the start angle the rear foot angle is 67 degrees when he pushes off again this guy also has hyper extension and during the flight phase the leg goes up why the leg goes up because of uh, hyper extension during this uh, push phase uh, there will be a signal which sends to the brain that okay if it goes beyond the limit then probably a uh, muscle tear will be there so a reflex action is produced and that makes the leg to flex and it goes higher and now instead of the athlete uh, diving linearly forward there will be a vertical drop and when the athlete is dropping vertically the drag effect on water when he is entering into the water there will be a lot of drag effect and plus his gliding phase will be relatively slow till he comes out of the water so losing timing factor is going to take place now the main thing he, one uh, here is that probably he needs to increase the angle of take off so here probably more than 90 degrees nobody can push off from a lower angle 67 degrees is too less so so raise the hip up try to have a higher knee angle Uh, and maybe by putting the foot little more down and pushing back the start uh, stop block little more back so you can increase that and through that way you can reduce the hyper uh, knee um, and, uh, hyper extension of the knee and of course again strengthening of the hamstring is little required here so that hyper extension doesn't take place and in that case if when the athlete is doing then probably he can clear more distance <clears throat> now this is a paralympic athlete uh, 
uh, normally they the there's uh, these people are bound to have lot of imbalances and uh, injury uh, during uh, powerlifting techniques so one is because only you see his amputee and uh, the balancing part plays an important role over here so what best can be done is uh, you can just tie a thread over here and when they are doing the lifts you can actually monitor well which side the hand is going when which direction the when which angle the thread is moving and according to that probably uh, you on a power rack you can fix the bar and ask them to focus on uh, development of strength in that particular position and stabilize the strength in that particular angles thus uh, they can improve their performance and uh, relatively get free from injury so here actually we were also seeing the sequence of the lift how the muscles are contracting and uh, in the power lifting so actually um, there was a lot of variations in this kind of athletes uh, some of them are actually starting from uh, pectoral uh, then the deltoid works and uh, uh, then the triceps and so on <coughs> okay there's uh, another uh, swimmer paralympic swimmer actually is uh, paralyzed and his uh, right leg is always floating and because of his right leg always floating uh, when uh, you you find that okay a lot of drag effect is there and because of this right leg always uh, dipped inside the water like this uh, the left shoulder had to undertake a heavier pull activity that means the depth of uh, the swim of this particular athlete uh, from uh, and the left stroke that is left side stroke was relatively deeper in order to compensate the body balance uh, and this fellow uh, could not increase his uh, frequency of uh, strokes or his, he cannot increase the speed of uh, his swimming strokes because uh, of this issue so what we did was that okay uh, in the plastic bag we fill air and we just tied on to his ankle joint so this made this uh, uh, free leg that is uh, paralyzed leg to float in the water little more higher the angle of uh, floating was relatively higher so for a paralympic athlete even 1 degree uh, change in the uh, uh there is a drag effect of this right leg would help him to increase the swim speed so when when we put the plastic bag and uh, made this uh, leg to float higher we could increase the training load of this athlete and uh, because now uh, his speed of uh, uh, speed of execution is increasing his frequency is uh, also uh, the number of strokes also increase and the velocity in which he could uh, execute the stroke movements also increased and thus uh, more training load could be uh, adhered for this athlete and uh, that facilitated the athlete to improve further in actual competition situation where his leg was still floating so this is how uh, you can modify the training uh, conditions when people have this kind of problems <clears throat> okay so this is a case of a low back pain uh, and you can see actually the cause of low back pain is a lot of internal rotation in the hip joint uh, so this all started because this athlete was having a relatively a bigger size shoe so when the toe goes inside the i mean when the foot is placed in the shoe still there is one one to one one and a half inch gap so what is happening when the uh, toe of position toe of is taking place uh, there is still one and a half inch of shoe left so when the push off is done there is actually pivoting of the foot and that leads to internal rotation of the foot and uh, and uh, leading to low back pains because continuously the pelvic uh, in the hip joint and the pelvic is turning anterior and posterior movements is taking place that led to low back pains 
so sometimes what actually happens is that okay see i gave you an example of the hockey stick here actually the parent has bought a longer shoe for this child that's that's the reason that this athlete was getting this kind of problems okay so i'll just skip this um okay this is an advice for uh, physiotherapists and uh, medical doctors now you must have heard about tandem cycling so it's actually an uh, uh, event where both two people are involved so normally the pilot who sits front he is actually a able bodied athlete whereas the person who is sitting behind he is a paralympic athlete so he will be uh, uh, normally he is uh, partially blind or full blind so actually what happened was that uh, uh, when these people were uh, used to do the training Uh, normally they train for a volume of 100 to 130 kilometers in a day uh, so the guy who was actually sitting in front was having a right rhomboid pain <clears throat> so uh, this boy came to the medical doctor and the medical doctor said okay uh, he, he sent them to the biomechanics for testing and when we did uh, when we wanted to do the testing we said i want also the person who is sitting behind to be there then only i can analyze the performance of this guy who is that is the pilot so the doctor said no no need of testing the guy who is sitting behind he doesn't have any injury <coughs> but uh, the person who is having injury only you need to test like that i mean the person who is injured but i insisted on and then when i started doing the analysis i found that okay the main problem for injury of this guy is the guy who is sitting behind because one is that uh he acts as a motor and another thing was that he was heavier than the pilot second thing is that his left leg was having greater cross sectional area as compared to right leg since he was a paralympic athlete probably he must have focused more on left leg there was no symmetrical balance so the cross sectional area greater cross sectional area means you are in a position to apply greater force from the left leg as compared to the right leg and this uh, force application from left leg always you should make the handle now let's say every time whenever the greater force application is there now the person who is sitting in the front is holding the cycle handle uh, this way uh, whenever force greater force application is there there's a slight protraction of the handle i mean that is uh, the shoulder that means the handle goes in forward like this and in order to retrieve that he has to pull back so in holding from this position when all of a sudden this takes place the muscle contracts in a eccentric way so first for first 30 kilometers you won't feel this because it's uh, from a fresh condition that uh, the athlete is experiencing that but after 30 kilometers onwards when the number of uh, times the every movement is taking place every pedal which is take i mean the person is doing according to that the cycle handle goes up and down like that so that was causing problem for the uh, the guy who was sitting in front and that led to injury so actually the correction here is more for the person who is sitting behind one is that uh strengthen the both uh, right and left leg stabilize uh the strength of both the left uh, right and left leg together and uh, uh, the second thing is that uh, this guy was a partially blind athlete so he says that he was a, he was like a motor and continuously doing pedaling so he used to always close the eyes and do the pedaling so even if you are a partially blind athlete you have to still keep your uh, eyes open so that you can maintain balance see now if i if we ask people to stand on single leg with eyes closed they lose they tend to lose balance so even if you are partially blind a slight amount of light coming into the eyes will make you to be conscious and to maintain your your neuro uh, vestibular apparatus will be in a position to maintain balance and that will help in maintaining balance of the cycle so my advice to medical doctors and physiotherapists is that whenever any uh, when this kind of uh, athletes come where 
two people are involved or two or three people are involved in uh, that particular event like uh, in rowing that i think four pairs or doubles or uh, eight people are sitting and doing and if anyone is getting an injury then probably almost everyone needs to be checked on in terms of what is actually the cause of injury and, uh, and according to that if the rectification is done for the group of people together then probably injury fat i mean injury can be avoided and it can help the athletes to perform better <clears throat> okay so this was actually the this is the rhomboid muscle which actually encounters the protraction and retraction okay anyway i have explained uh, okay so with this uh, uh, my intention was basically uh, making you all understand the internal and external risk, risk factors as well as the, the inciting events in terms of injury mechanism and early technique correction and specific training programs would significantly reduce the incidence of injuries so coaches are the ones who should realize the technical issues but unfortunately they do not have enough sports science support so probably uh, more of sports scientists should come in the country and people who are doing uh, sports uh, sports and exercise uh, degrees or degrees or in, even in physical education people they should come in as sports scientists help the athletes to improve the performance with this thank you very much thank you for listening mm. no. uh, uh, dr saju ne ye conclude kiya ki humko sahi technique se uh, apna sport sikhana chahiye shuru se aur uh, usse injury bhi nahi hogi aur usse sahi performance bhi aayega so uh, dr saju the most important question is that uh, in most of the uh, you know training or in coaching uh, the experienced coaches are always going to uh, experienced athletes and uh, uh, relatively younger coaches or those who have just started coaches coaching are there with uh new beginners or new athletes new learners so isn't it a bit of a dichotomy that uh, with beginners there should be very experienced trainers so that right from beginning they learn the correct techniques what are your what is your answer to this question uh it's true that actually uh, actually see um i feel that uh, yeah experienced coaches should also work in the grassroots level so that the, they their knowledge and uh, their uh, experience can be ex uh, taught i mean uh, that can be delivered to these kids that will facilitate them to learn the things in a much better way and uh, of course uh, in coaching category if you look into there are people who work in grassroots and those who work with elite sports uh, uh, but once uh, there should be some kind of system in our country that okay people who have worked with elite sport also should be in a position to be a kind of master coach or something like that so that they can deliver this to the uh, newcomers and uh, new coaches and they can in, in turn transfer the knowledge to the kids so if that kind of system is there then probably it would be really helpful uh, at the same time okay uh, even the national elite level athletes also require uh, or you know um, that kind of coaches experience coaches uh, yeah uh, it's really i think the correct mix is required and also mere hisab se train the trainer should keep happening regularly so that yes. the the younger coaches are trained you know from time to time in the correct technique suppose if they are doing something wrong and that can be corrected uh, also uh, with the technology uh, uh, you know uh, improving so much uh, videos can easily be exchanged between uh, younger coaches and senior coaches to uh, to show that this is what i am teaching is it correct yeah yeah this is the correct technique 
तो मेरे हिसाब से मैं इसको हिंदी में बोलूंगा कि जो यंगर कोचेस हैं हमारे वो अपने सीनियर कोचेस से कंटिन्यूसली उनका एक्सचेंज रहना चाहिए कि और अपने जो जिस जो तकनीक सिखा रहे हैं वो और जो उनके एथलीट्स कर रहे हैं उसको अपने सीनियर कोचेस के साथ एक्सचेंज करते रहना चाहिए जिससे कि ये हमेशा मालूम पड़ता रहे जो यंगर कोचेज हैं और जो अभी नए आए हैं इस फील्ड में कि वो सही तकनीक सिखा रहे हैं या नहीं तो जो सीनियर कोचेज हैं वो हमेशा ये बता सकते हैं कि नहीं इसमें ये छोटी सी गड़बड़ इसमें ये छोटी सी मिस्टेक है तो ये बिटवीन द कोचिंग कम्युनिटी ये चीज हमेशा रहनी चाहिए आपस में नॉलेज का आदान प्रदान बहुत जरूरी है मैं ये सोचता हूँ कि नॉलेज शेयरिंग इज वेरी इंपॉर्टेंट बिटवीन द यंगर लॉट एंड द सीनियर लॉट and this should keep happening continuously and in in uh, in our as as uh, administrators and as uh, senior people in the sports administration we should also try that we keep giving training to our younger coaches on a regular basis from uh, seniors we will keep trying this and i am sure usi usi ke tahat ye pura jo hamara session chal raha hai ye isi liye chal raha hai ki hum sahi cheez हमेशा सबको बताएं थैंक यू या यू कैन टेक क्वेश्चंस नाउ प्लीज दिस वाज अ क्वेश्चन इन द इन द चैट बॉक्स दैट्स व्हाई आई टुक अप दिस क्वेश्चन देयर इज वन क्वेश्चन आस्क्ड बाय शीतल चौहान इन कोको मोस्ट ऑफ द एथलीट्स यूज्ड टू प्ले विद मड ग्राउंड बट व्हेन दे केम फॉर नेशनल्स और नेशनल कैंप्स दे हैव टू प्ले ऑन मैट्स दैट टाइम मोस्ट ऑफ द प्लेयर्स स्टार्ट सफरिंग विद नी back pain ankle pain etc how can we prevent uh so i am not sure about what kind of mats uh, uh these people are playing uh, not touch with coco for quite long but i just want to see whether it is a judo kind or kabaddi uh, kabaddi mats that they are using if it is so then probably uh uh see one is that when you are playing on mud there is not much of bounce in the mud but when you come into this kind of match a slight cushioning effect is there which changes the me uh, running mechanics so probably in, because of change of uh, running mechanics that leads to uh, knee joint going ahead of the ankle joint or uh, the shock observation is uh, because the cushioning effect is going to create uh, a continuous uh, effect even in ankle joint knee joint hip joint uh, there will be some amount of in, slight impact movements because of the bounce so that may be the reason that all these joints are getting uh, affected so change of uh, 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 training venues normally uh, does training venues means training situations uh, normally Leads to some kind of uh, problems. So uh, one is that okay, it, it, uh, when you start the camps under these conditions, probably the coaches should focus on reducing the training load and volume in the initial stages. Let the athletes get adapted to the conditions of the mat, and then gradually increase the training load. Means okay, then uh, the athletes can get adapted uh, to the situations at a faster rate. Yes. How many days our neural will take for the adaptation of a single thing? How many times we have to repeat a particular action? <laughs> <laughs> so this is uh, depending upon the age. Uh, neural adaptation basically it depends upon the age and type of activity which you are doing. uh simple uh exercises neural adaptations will take at a faster rate complex activities adaptations takes a little more longer uh so variations is there and again uh, depending upon the observation capacity of the particular individual and focusing ability uh some can learn things little more faster and get uh, adapted at a faster rate uh, compared to people who have little time i mean they require little more time for getting adapted and as i told you earlier 
like Annavi who was doing uh, scissors earlier and changing his technique totally to Fosbury flop. He had to spend a lot of time to change his technique. So that adaptation takes much longer time. So varied uh, conditions are there. So nowadays all are uh, having an effect on knee injury. How we prevent from these injuries? Uh, yeah, uh, good question actually. Yeah. Uh, one other thing is that uh, you have to strengthen various joints and you have to also learn the mechanics of uh, the particular sport concern. Uh, specificity of exercising and also in, in the initial stages, general exercising, uh, general modes of exercising uh, in which uh, there is probability of wide range of movements taking place means then in that particular thing, you have to have general, uh, general exercising mode and then switch over to specific mode in terms of only certain specific actions which are involved in that particular sport. So in that way, you can actually um, improve upon. In badminton, Gobi sir told us to land with heel while going front. You mean lunging? I'm not sure about the question. Does it mean lunging? Uh, okay, uh, you, you can land on the heel, uh, but then uh, if you have good in soles, then probably you can observe the shock and then, but then in pushing back, always pushing back from the heel, is, uh, 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 it can lead to a certain uh, amount of issues like compartmental syndrome, uh, because always landing on the heel uh, is not good. So whereas the, actually, the, see, the anatomical structure of human is that the foot, the metatarsals and uh, tarsals and metatarsals are arranged in such a way that it can absorb the shock of the foot while landing. So if you land on front foot, then the shock observation is relatively better as compared to landing on the heel. Uh, uh, probably I need to clarify this with Govisar why he insists that. Uh, <clears throat> A lot of questions are there on uh, change of playing surface. You know, on the chat box I'm seeing. A lot of questions are there on change of playing surface. So, uh, generally, change of playing surface you have already covered. That it will make a big difference in, uh, in you know, in the, in, in the cushioning effect. Basically, from, from a wooden surface to a synthetic surface or from uh, a normal grassy surface to a synthetic surface. That's correct. Okay, there is actually one question. Uh, why lunging? Should the heel strike first or the forefoot strike first? Now, when the... Uh, now, I'm just giving an example. Okay. Now, when the lunging movement is in line with the knee, landing on the forefoot is easy. Okay. Uh, and that will absorb the shock relatively but, uh, in a better way. But when you extend your leg and land, okay, landing on the forefoot is not going to be easy. So there you tend to land on the heel because the first contact point will be heel because there will be dorsiflexion. So your contact of uh, contact will be heel, and that that can be. I mean, if it is straight knee landing, that can lead to issues. So what you can do is that, okay, if you want to land on heel, I mean, you go for a lunge with a heel landing, but then you, immediately you should be in a position to shift the body weight forward. Then probably the injury chances can be avoided. If you remain in that post, particular position and then try to retreat back, then probably the chance of injury is going to be greater in that case. Which okay. Karan Kapadia has asked one question. Which exercise is useful for shoulder joint pain during after push-up? Because I have pain in my shoulder after during maximum number of push-ups. 600 push-ups daily. Yes. 
<laughs> so 600 push up is actually a too big volume of training and naturally uh, your muscles are uh, really you know so there'll be a dorms effect and that can result in uh yeah pain okay so any other important question you find uh, commander i am just having a look uh tennis elbow is asking it's a wrong technique or imbalance of muscle activation long tennis What? elbow uh is it a wrong technique it is due to wrong technique or imbalance of muscle activation uh there could be both both involvement if a wrong technique is there that also can lead to uh, tennis elbow and imbalance uh, between biceps and triceps uh, in uh, flexion and L, uh, that also can lead to uh, there will be some amount of imbalance depending upon the domination of your activity if you are doing something always throwing throwing okay then probably uh, your triceps will be much more uh, stronger in explosive movements as compared to biceps movement so yeah there has you need to develop a, a symmetry between be, uh, both this group of muscles so that uh, the hyper extension can be relatively avoided there is one question from haritar what kind of shoes do you suggest athletes having flat foot uh <clears throat> see um shoes can be relatively any type but then uh, most important thing is that the insole okay uh it took main main thing is to create uh, a arch in that area of the that's uh, where the cuneiform and the tarsal bones are there. i mean basically to create and between the phalanges uh, sorry met, meta metatarsal uh, so that uh, that will facilitate uh, a little more cushioning effect for you to do activities uh, so nowadays uh, see there are customized uh, insoles being built and also there are uh, 3d model custom i um, mean customized soles being made so what the uh, now they do is that they make you to stand on a, a scanner and they uh, the foot uh, uh, they get a uh, print of the foot and based on that they make a customized uh, 3d model insole so automatically in the insole itself it gives some amount of arch which facilitate a little amount of cushioning on your foot while wearing it inside the shoe that's uh, so that's one way <clears throat> um one question is that uh, in general a human body is left and right are not equal uh there is a difference between the left side and the right side so what should we do to make it equal should we give different uh, different uh, amount of exercise to left and right to make them equal oh uh, yeah you can uh... ideally do same amount of workload or uh, one is isolation of exercising normally what happens is now for example when you do uh, uh, like leg press okay my right leg is strong so what uh, if i'm doing on a uh, leg press system my right leg will take the lead and the left leg will be just trailing behind okay while exercising so uh, what happens is that the right leg will become stronger and stronger and the left will become weaker so instead of that what we need to do is isolation of the muscle groups so what you need to do right leg alone leg press and then left leg alone leg press so when you do isolation so e both the group of muscles are undergoing the same volume of training same load and same uh, repetitions so thus you can imp improve the strength level of both the groups of muscles the both the sides simultaneously and almost equal okay that's a very good answer uh, i think we should all do this <clears throat> i think balance questions are all sport specific so we will not go into those i think you have covered lot of sports today 
so yeah. with your permission we will stop the session now it's been a long right. session and pichle 3 dino mein dr saju ne humko kafi kuch technical cheeze batayi jo ki unhone pehle din humko running mechanics ke bare mein bataya dusre din cycling ke bare mein bataya aur aaj unhone ek bahut sare sports ko cover kiya जिससे कि हर एक के बारे में थोड़ा थोड़ा जो टेक्निक्स है वो मालूम पड़े और क्या गलतियां हैं वो मालूम पड़े बायो मैकेनिक्स एक बहुत ही विस्तृत सब्जेक्ट है जिसको तीन लैंग्वेज में कवर करना बहुत मुश्किल है और हम कोशिश करेंगे कि जो स्पोर्ट्स स्पेसिफिक क्लासेस हों उनमें भी कुछ कुछ स्पोर्ट्स स्पेसिफिक बायो के बारे में आगे कभी कवर किया जाए लेकिन जितना डॉक्टर साजू से हो सकता था उन्होंने मेन मेन पॉइंट्स हम सबको बताए उनके उसके लिए आई विल बी वेरी आई एम वेरी थैंकफुल टू हिम फॉर टेलिंग स्पेसिफिक थिंग्स अबाउट टेलिंग बेसिक थिंग्स अबाउट व्हाट मिस्टेक्स वी डू एंड हाउ वी कैन स्टॉप इंजरी एंड इम्प्रूव परफॉर्मेंस ऑफ आर एथलीट्स थैंक यू वेरी मच थैंक यू डॉक्टर मजूमदार थैंक यू डॉक्टर सरला for being with us and thank you all participants uh, tomorrow we will start with something different so let's uh, have uh, you again tomorrow and thank you i will stop the session now thank you very much all right thank you thank you